Well, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. As we gather this morning in our homes, uh, we uh, were able to worship God in this way and grace to you and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ as you gather where you are. I want to thank you for uh, your prayers for us as elders uh, for our meeting on Friday and as we continue to wrestle with, uh, with our, um, what we're going to do and how to respond to some of the government restrictions. Um, I just very interesting that just actually a few minutes ago, uh, uh, Dr. Strang responded to the, uh, the letter we had sent him, and it seems like, again, it was a personal response from him because he engages a little bit with the, uh, with the nature of the church though he disagrees that we need to gather together uh, to be had to have uh, for worship to take place. But I will, uh, I'll forward that out uh, after the service so you can, you can take a look at that. Um, uh, one interesting note just in the email is, is that uh, he suggests that phase two gatherings will be allowed with uh, limits to be determined, which maybe means he's changing um, because according to the plan they released the other day, uh, the limits were going to be 10 people indoors. So we can pray maybe that they're rethinking or looking at that. And uh, we, of course, um, will be, uh, I, I intend uh, to follow up. Um, and uh, even before I got this response, I intended to follow up and to, uh, and uh, we'll do that as a session as well. That's, so we're gonna continue to engage with our government um, and uh, with Dr. Strang, with our local MLA. Uh, but as you read in the bulletin, um, uh, we are doing what we did last year, which is taking advantage of the opportunity to gather in some form uh, as soon as we're able to do that. And so next week, uh, we're going to begin uh, gathering in groups of 10 uh, outdoors, under a tent, on the front lawn uh, of our uh, church facility here. And uh, we're going to, to gather in groups of 10. Um, and uh, I think we should be able to accommodate everyone in five, uh, in five services. So um, I'll send out details about that uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so so uh, just, uh, just giving you the heads up um, as we think about that and, and what that might look like. So I'll, uh, but I'll send details on Tuesday and you can have any, any questions you might have for me. Um, you can be in touch after that as well. Um, but again, we're going to continue to appeal to the government for greater inclusion, for greater consistency, for greater consideration. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Strang's response did not address the inconsistency in the government's uh, approach to, uh, to, to worship as compared to other, other things like mental health gatherings. But we'll, uh, let's just keep praying and uh, thank the Lord for a response and for some engagement there. Uh, one just note, as we uh, worship after the service again this morning, we will have a sermon discussion time on Zoom. Uh, the link is in the email that I sent out yesterday, so we've... Uh, enjoyed uh, those discussion times. If you haven't joined us yet, feel free to do that and uh, join in and enjoy some fellowship as well. Well, let's prepare to, uh, to worship our God. Um, let's let's um, hear him call us to worship to begin our service this morning. The call to worship is from Psalm 103, the wonderful psalm of comfort, and we'll read the first five verses. Bless the Lord... O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's cry out to our God as we begin our worship service. Let's praise his name and seek his blessing on our time this morning. O Lord our God, as we reflect on your blessings and care for us, there are no shortage of things for which we can say, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, your benefits are abundant, your love overwhelming, your mercies to us are new and awesome every morning. Lord, especially when we consider how you saved us from destruction, when we consider the forgiveness of our sins and the reestablished relationship that we have with you, O oh Lord, especially when we consider the benefits and the blessings of the gospel of Christ, our Savior, that are ours, freely given to us by you. 
O oh Lord, you satisfy us with all good things. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord, for again blessing us with a Sabbath day. Give us delight in the day. Satisfy us this morning as we worship you. Fill our souls with joy in you and your word. And give us a longing for next week already when we can again begin gathering together for worship. Lord, thank you for this time now. And may we, Lord, be thankful for every, every moment of it. And bless us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn in the word of God to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We'll read the first 11 verses for the revelation of God's will this morning. And as we consider our own hearts and our conformity to Christ and how we live as brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul writes to the Philippians and to us, to the church of all ages, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Well, let's come before our God to seek his grace that we might live and uh, live in our lives, live together in, in uh, Christ as a good reflection of our Savior. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, in your word, you tell us that you have determined to exalt your Son through the salvation of sinners, to lift him up, to make him the firstborn among many brethren. To make man holy, O oh Lord, is to exalt Christ in his work of salvation, and that is what you determined to do. And if Christ is to be the firstborn among many brethren, then as he is, so we must be as well in, uh, in holiness, to be true brothers of, with Christ, to be holy and righteous. And Lord, we're reminded in this passage of just how glorious the work of salvation is, how glorious is the humility of Christ and his exaltation. And we're taught in this passage how we need to be like him in his service and how he gives himself for his people. We must have the same servant mind and the same servant heart of Christ as we live in the church and love one another in the church. We must think better of others than we do of ourselves. We must act selflessly as he did putting others before us. We need the mind of Christ that is so clearly shown across the pages of Scripture. O oh Lord, we confess this morning how little we look or act like our Savior. The calling is high, and we are not able in ourselves to meet the standard of perfection that is required. We're not able in ourselves to live up to the high calling you've called us to. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that because of Christ's perfect work, we can be forgiven. Because of our elder brother, we can be forgiven. And so we pray, forgive us, Lord, for Christ's sake. We have not obeyed 
is this command. We thank you that being made more like Christ is the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. So we know, Lord, and we have confidence that your purposes and Christ's work will be accomplished in us, that you will work it out in us. Blessed be your name for such a salvation. O oh Lord, make us then more like Christ. As the body of believers here at Covenanters and, and with others in Christ with whom we interact through the week, make us more like Christ. Make us more and more to be of one mind, of one love, and unify us more and more together in Christ. All to the glory and the exaltation of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He indeed would be the firstborn among many brethren, and we would lift him up in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our words of assurance are from Romans 8, 28 to 30, where we hear and are reminded of the, of the work of God, that his work in us is, is his determined work, and so we have kind of confidence. We have confidence in our forgiveness in Christ and that God will continue to build us up as his people. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Just as Christ has been raised up in glory, so you and I, our, our salvation is so secure, we can speak of our glorification as it were as a past tense thing, because it will happen. God himself guarantees it. Let's give thanks to our God. Let's um, turn now to Psalm 122. Psalm 122, as we... We'll read this psalm, then turn to Colossians 4 and consider the beginning of the end of that book. In Psalm 122, we have uh, an Old Testament example of what we're going to find in Colossians 4, which is just those that are, that are um, spoken of in this psalm are engaged in not just seeking their own best interests, but seeking the good of the church, seeking the good of all those who love the Lord, seeking the peace and prosperity of Jerusalem for the sake of the presence of God in the temple and for those who desire to worship God. And so as we consider this psalm and then consider Colossians 4, we can see how the, the mutual love for the church are seen. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a common love for the church in both places. Psalm 122, a song of ascents of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Let's turn now to Colossians 4. <coughs> Colossians 4, we'll read verses 2 to 18. I'm going to be considering verses 7 to 14 this morning. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, 
for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you. And those who are in Laodicea and those in, who are in Hierapol, Hierapolis, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus in the church that is in his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains, grace be with you. Amen. Let's ask the Lord to bless the preaching of his word. Lord, we depend upon you to understand this word, to live it out in the way that you want us to. Oh, Lord God, we do pray that you would come upon us by your Spirit and instruct us through the preaching of the Word, that you, Lord, would receive every bit of praise for any blessing that this Word brings to our lives, any growth that takes place in our Christian life, any way in which we're encouraged is all to your glory and to your credit. I do pray that you would equip me to proclaim your Word faithfully and well, and in an edifying way. But Lord, we depend not on me, but on you for this word to have a blessing. And so bless us with it, Lord. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand and a, and a both a desire and an obedience to live out uh, what we hear and, and, and learn from this passage. So bless this word, we pray this morning in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are fast coming to the end of the book of Colossians. Lord willing, uh, next week we'll finish this letter of Paul to the Colossian church. And as we come to the end, we come to the concluding parts of the letter. And perhaps as we come to these concluding words, these concluding verses, things might not seem as uh, interesting, or the letter might not seem as exciting and exciting to learn what, what is being said. It seems that we have here a, a standard way of finishing out a letter of the New Testament, and, and even a letter we might write, just a number of greetings and just final details. But it seems that we were past, as it were, the, uh, the, the, the meat of the letter. You think of a sandwich, and you've got, you've got two slices of bread and the meat. And we're usually more excited about what's between the slices of bread than we are about the bread itself. And so we're thinking, well, now we, you know, the middle's better. Now we're coming to the end, the other slice. It's not going to be as good. But let me tell you that as we consider these words, and that we need to, we need to, we're going to be richly blessed by them. For these words are given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They're not just add-on things. There is rich blessing. This is rich food for us to, to take in, to enjoy, and to be blessed, well-nourished in our souls. What we have in these words that we're going to consider this morning from verses 7 to 14 is a is, is a clear demonstration of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation of these various people, these various men we're going to talk about. Various backgrounds, and yet all 
knowing the power, powerful salvation of Jesus Christ. We're going to consider the unity and the fellowship that they have together of diverse backgrounds and statuses, but they are united together, not just in fellowship with one another in Christ, but with a grand love for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, even the church that is hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away in Colossae. And we're going to consider how they then bless the church, how they serve the church, how they seek to, to be a blessing to the church in the various ways they're able to, and hopefully learn from that for our own service to the church as Christians today. These are not dry words, but they are heartfelt, spirit-inspired encouragements for the church then and for the church today. What we have before us, brothers and sisters, is, a, is an example of how we can care for the church. How much do you care for your brothers and sisters in Christ, not just here in this local church, but in the church more broadly, in the church across the world? How much do you care for them? Being in Christ is, is a wonderful blessing, and it does matter to us very much as individuals who are in Christ, but it's much more than just an individual faith. We are, we are to be, we are united to those who are also in Christ across the globe, one body united to the head, Jesus Christ. And does that, is that reflected in how much we love the church, how much we care for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? These verses set an example for us, but they also are here to encourage us, also here to encourage us as we consider how these men who didn't really know the Colossian church personally, but how they prayed for them, how they sent greetings, love, expressed their love for them in Christ and, and cared for them in the ways that they could. As we think about there are those beyond our own local church who pray for us who are encouraged by us, who are thankful for us, who want to see the church prosper and flourish here in this place. When you think of our presbytery and the frequent prayers that go up from the, the, the other pastors and elders and other congregations for our local church and how they're excited to see and hear of the Lord's work here. When you think of our local, local churches with whom we have fellowship, who are excited and thankful to find like-minded believers in, in many ways and are praying for our success in the gospel. Think of former members of, who, have, who are no longer here but have, have moved away and, and but yet still hold us close in their heart and regularly pray for us. Or perhaps those who, who supplied the church here, who preached over the years. This should encourage us for what was going on towards the Colossians also happens towards us. God is at work through the prayers, not just our prayers, but the prayers of many others many whom we may not even know, who pray for us. And so we need to read these verses and drink deeply of the rich encouragement that is here. We need to absorb the example of the love for Christ's church that's evident in these verses, and we need to be encouraged by it and then go and do likewise. And so in these verses, we're going to consider that the greetings from Paul and his fellow workers show us faithful so as Christ's faithful care for his church and how we should care for Christ's church. The greetings from Paul and his fellow workers show us Christ's faithful care for his church and how we, in turn, should care for Christ's church. We're going to break this into two sections. First, verses 7 to 9, those bringing greetings from Paul, and then verses 10 to 14, those sending greetings through Paul. We're going to look at these greetings in these two sections, verses 7 to 9, and then verses 10 to 14, considering each group here. First, we have those bringing greetings from Paul. And we have here Tychicus and Onesimus. Paul is, is, is coming to the end of his letter, and yet he's not coming to the end of his care for the Colossian church. He's not just saying, good, I've written the letter. Like you might send an email, hit send, and, and file it away and be done with it. You're talking to somebody, you're engaged with something. Paul, no, Paul is thinking, okay, I've done this letter. How now can I continue to love this church, care for them? Well, Paul determines that a good way to do this is to send Tychicus. To send Tychicus. He was one who had accompanied Paul on different of his missionary journeys. We find him in the book of Acts and, and is well mentioned in a few other epistles. He was somebody who actually was from that same region, though that it seems that he, wasn't, he had never been to the Colossian church. But he was from the same province of the Roman Empire, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And so perhaps he was going home. Perhaps he was heading that direction. And, and Paul 
was entrusting him with this letter that he had written to the Colossian church, as well as the letter to the Ephesians, because we find very similar language in the letter to the Ephesians regarding Tychicus. Bringing this letter to the Colossian church. And Paul was sending not just anybody, it wasn't just the first, ma- the first one who volunteered to be the mailman, but he sends, it seems, he specifically wants Tychicus to go. He, he, has great, he has great confidence in Tychicus. We see this in the warm way in which he describes him. He calls him a beloved brother. Much affection from Paul. These weren't just throwaway words. He calls him a faithful minister. He was a minister of the gospel. He was somebody who Paul trusted. He was somebody who would make a good ambassador for, the, for, the, for what Paul wanted to be done and for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was somebody who the Colossians needed to know was trustworthy, considering their experience with false teachers. Here's somebody who they could trust. And he was a bondservant, a fellow servant in the Lord, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul describes himself and Timothy at the beginning of the letter. Here is one who is fully given over to Christ. His life, his everything is given in service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has great confidence in Tychicus. Well, why was Paul sending him? Well, Paul says he sends him. He said, I'm sending him to tell you all the news about me. And then in verse 8, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Now, in, the, in other translations, you'll see that it's not that he may know your circumstances, but that you may know our circumstances. And just a couple letters difference in the original language make the difference there. And I, actually, I think that that translation makes more sense because it, when you compare it and take it in the context of verse 7 and verse 9, it seems very much that Paul is concerned that the Colossians are set at ease about what God is doing in Rome. So that Tychicus is going to let them know about Paul's circumstances in prison and thus able to, uh, to comfort the Colossians who would have been quite concerned about Paul. Tychicus is going to bring news, to bring news from Paul. He's bringing the letter And in those days, a letter carrier was not just a letter carrier. He was somebody who would also be given the authority to explain what was in the letter, to give further detail, to expound it. In other words, to preach the word that Paul had written. And then second, to give an update on Paul, which Paul gives only sparse details in the letter itself. And he would rather have Tychicus give a verbal update as to what the Lord was doing in Rome, how the Lord was caring for Paul, how the Lord was using Paul for the furtherance of the gospel. You know, it's interesting. Paul is in prison. We've seen this before in this letter. Paul is in prison, in chains, and yet his care and burden is for the Colossian church. His care and burden is that their minds and heart are set at ease, that that he's saying, yes, the Lord is caring for me. Don't worry about me. And so he sends a brother who maybe even uh, perhaps uh, uh, Paul could have used him in Rome for his own care, but he sends him to the Colossians to make this trip. Tychicus was sent to minister to them. To, to comfort their hearts, to serve them. Paul was sending one to care for the Colossians. And God has blessed the ministry of Tychicus, not just to the Colossians, but to us. Because this letter was faithfully carried there. This letter was faithfully given. This letter has been preserved. This letter has been given to us who are still blessed by the ministry of Paul as it's expressed in this particular letter. Tychicus a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. Well, the, number, the second one who's bringing greetings from Paul was Onesimus. Tychicus was sent with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. Well, who is Onesimus? Well, we're actually going to consider Onesimus in a bit more detail in a few weeks as we get, once we get into uh, the next letter that I'm going to go through, that we're going to preach, which is the letter of Philemon, the letter to Philemon, which is about Onesimus. Philemon was a member of the Colossian church. In fact, the Colossian church met in his house, and, and they would gather for worship there. But Philemon had a slave named Onesimus who, was a, who did not serve him well, who was not a believer at the time, he ran away. He ran away. And where did he run? He ran to Rome, which was not a small distance away. He ran all the way to Rome, which was a good place if you wanted to get lost in the crowds, if you wanted nobody to find you. But God found him. And God brought him under the ministry of Paul. And Onesimus came to faith in Christ. And now 
Paul is sending him back to the church and sending him back to Philemon, which is what the letter of Philemon is about, and we're going to consider it. But Paul is not sending him back as that slave that ran away. No, Paul is sending him as a beloved brother, the same description he gave to Tychicus. He's a beloved brother. What astounding words to speak of a slave who was still a slave, hadn't been set free. But Paul spoke to him as a beloved brother. Now, Anesimus, no doubt, was nervous going back to, uh, going back to Colossae, back to that situation, but he had this that he knew in this letter there was, a, there was a commendation from Paul, the apostle, about him. And there was another letter that was going to Philemon. And the Colossians would have, were, would have been encouraged and told of Paul. Basically, he's a, if, if Paul considers him a beloved brother, we need to receive him as a beloved brother. And Philemon would have heard that as well as he sat on and heard this letter read by Tychicus. What we have here is chapter 3, verse 11, being worked out. Right? Paul says, well, those who are in Christ, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And Paul is saying, these aren't just words I've written in a letter. You have it in the flesh. There's Onesimus. He's a beloved brother. He's a beloved brother. And all the divisions that were going on in the Colossian church when they were divided between Jew and Greek, where they were divided between slave and free, and they were receiving this instruction of Paul, and now they're being put to shame because Paul is saying, I don't just say it, I live it. He is a beloved brother in Christ. Whatever else he is, he is a beloved brother in Christ. Demonstrating the power of God to save such a one as Onesimus. Wow, Onesimus, what a change. What a change. Here, here I am sending one who was once unprofitable to you, he says to Philemon, but now is profitable for you. And he's saying that essentially to the church. He's one of you. Now I'm sending him back. He's a member of your church. He will be a faithful member. Here are these two men come to make known to the Colossians all things which are happening here, Paul writes. Tychicus with his words, Onesimus with his life living, breathing example of what God is doing, taking hard-hearted sinners and changing them by the power of the gospel, as he did with Onesimus. What an encouragement this must have been to the church. These greetings from Paul and his fellow workers show us Christ's faithful care for his church and give us an example of how we ought to care for Christ's church as well. We learn that from not only through the, those who are bringing greetings from Paul, but also uh, from those who are sending greetings through Paul. We, that's our second point as we look at verses 10 to 14. And verses 10 to 14 are divided uh, the, into two groups of three men. First you have three Jews and then you have three Gentiles. Neatly divided between these two groups. Well, first in verses 10 and 11 you have the three Jews that Paul references. First we have Aristarchus. Paul says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Aristarchus, again, was somebody who traveled with Paul. In fact, we find him traveling with Paul all the way to Rome. And uh, at the end of the book of Acts, as, there, as Paul is, is a prisoner making his way to Rome. Oh, Paul here calls Aristarchus his fellow prisoner, and there's debate in the commentaries as to whether this was meant a literal prisoner or a spiritual prisoner, whether it was meant literally or figuratively. And, and uh I think that this it has to be taken as a spiritual reference. The reason, one of the reasons being, and I think the main reason being, that if you look at the book of Philemon, Paul, Paul uh, references Epaphras, who we're going to get to, as a fellow prisoner as well, but doesn't say that about Aristarchus. And it seems interesting that because Epaphras was from Colossae, you think if he was also a literal prisoner with Paul, that he would have, Paul would have mentioned something to the church about this and told them about Epaphras and everything else he said about him seems like there's a spiritual, this is a, this is a spiritual label. He's a spiritual prisoner. Paul was a literal prisoner, but, but Aristarchus, who was ministering to Paul and caring for Paul and with Paul, was, as it were, a, a figurative prisoner. He's with me so much, but also one who is sharing with Paul in his bonds, sharing with him in his sufferings for the name of Christ, giving his own life for Christ as Paul did. And so they're ministering together, though Paul is physically bound or literally in, in prison or under house arrest. This Aristarchus, whatever else, we, we don't know much more about him, but he doesn't say much more here, but he sends greetings. Whether he, he 
likely had never been to Colossae, had not met the Colossians. Paul had never been to Colossae, and so Aristarchus wouldn't have been traveling with him there. But yet he still is united together with this church in Christ, still sends his greetings, still has affection for them, still loves them, though he had never met them. Why? Because he's a Christian, and they're Christians. Because he's of the church, and they're of the church. The second Jew mentioned here is Mark. Now, Mark uh, is better known to us, and Mark is, is, a, uh, is the gospel writer of the gospel of Mark. He was a, uh, he was a close spiritual uh, child of Peter. He was a cousin of Barnabas, as we find out in this passage. But he was also at one time at odds with Paul. At one time, there was division between Paul and Mark and Paul and Barnabas because of Mark. Mark was a young man who went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. But partway through, we read in Acts 13, he left them and went back to Jerusalem. And then in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas were going to go visit the churches again that they had planted, Barnabas wanted to take Mark. And Paul said no. And we we're told the division between them was so great that they separated. Paul took Silas and went one direction. Barnabas took Mark and went another direction. It was a sad division in the church. Division in the church is not new. But it was sad. And these brothers, they, they, there was, would, have, would have no doubt caused some trouble in the church and discouragement in the church, even though both men may very well have been right. Barnabas wanting to help Mark and see him grow and advance and mature in gospel ministry. Paul, seeing that he had been a coward and, 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 and returned home and, and was saying he's not mature enough and I'm not taking him. We don't need a re repeat of what happened. But look what happens as we hear these words now. 12 years or so later, 12, 14 years later, there's reconciliation in the Christ. Listen to how Paul speaks about Mark. He, he speaks of him as a cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions, likely from Paul. If he comes to you, welcome him. Welcome him. And then he's going to say, uh, Mark, along with these other two Jews, they've proved to be a, he's proved to be a comfort to Paul. And Paul is, writes to Timothy later in 2 Timothy, and he says, bring Mark. He's been a, com he's been a useful to me. He wants Mark to come to him. Paul is commending Mark to the Colossian church. What an example of Christ's healing power. What, a, what an example of how, how God humbles his people and binds them together in reconciliation. Where there was once division, he heals the divine. What an example to the Colossian church where there, was, there, there were divisions among them. Where there were, there were those who were at odds with each other. And Paul is saying, look, you know of this. This was no, no doubt a public event that there was division, but now it's been healed over, and I'm not holding a grudge, and we're not holding it against each other. We've overcome this by the grace of God. Here's Mark, an example of what Christ can do and what Christ can do for you. What an example for you if you've acted in a cowardly way as a Christian. And perhaps you've beat yourself up and you've given up and you said, there's no hope. I've, 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 I've denied my Lord or I've acted cowardly and I, I'm not bold for the gospel. That there's hope. There's restoration through Christ. There's the Holy Spirit's power to make you bold for the gospel, to encourage you, to give you the courage to live for Christ in a broken, fallen world. And third person mentioned is justice. And really that's, or Jesus, who is called Justice. Jesus means Savior. Here his surname would have been Justice. That's all we know about him. So that's, that's basically it. Uh, that we, we don't, we're not given any more details. He's not mentioned anywhere else. But what we can find here is Paul is referencing these three Jews. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. That's how we know they're Jews. They're of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort for me. Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice, or Jesus called Justice. Paul is so thankful for them, though there's a, there's a sense of lamenting, isn't there? In Acts 28, 30, we're told that, that Paul was in Rome, he was in Rome, and he was, he was preaching the kingdom of God to the Jews. He was seeking to, to bring them into the kingdom of God. Now here we have the same language. Only these three are left of fellow workers from the Jews. Fellow workers for the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean there were no other converted Jews, doesn't mean there weren't other believers, but these were the only three Jews who, who, uh, who were called out to be serving in the church, who were willing to be associated with the gospel that Paul proclaimed, who were willing to, 
to put aside the distinction of circumcision to realize that there is no circumcision or uncircumcision for Christ is all and in all. These men were still a comfort to Paul and they were now being a comfort to the Colossian church, sending their greetings, sending their love. And Mark, it seems, was about to come visit them to bless the church. Well, there were these three Jews and then we have, in verses 12 to 14, the three Gentiles. Well, we have these six men together, which is interesting, and I've just hinted at this. Again, we have uh, three, chapter 3, verse 11 in, in, uh, being laid out, being practiced. Here were six men, Jews and Gentiles of different levels of society, different places, and yet they're, they were united together in Christ. Those distinctions were not there anymore. Those differences were not those that, were not those that divided anymore. They were the same. They were one in Jesus Christ and what an example it would have been to the Colossian church. Again, of this worked out in practice. Paul his ministry is prospering by those who are brought together from different backgrounds that are brought together in unity in Jesus Christ. First, we have Epaphras, and most of our time is spent here in Epaphras. Epaphras, we've, we've already met him in chapter 1, where Paul writes of Epaphras uh, that he was the one who had initially brought the gospel to the Colossians. Speaking of the word, which you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Epaphras was one who, uh, who we understand to, to have been a convert of Paul's, probably in Ephesus, and who then went out into the Lycus Valley, which was there in, in, uh, not too far from Ephesus, and, and he seems to have been a church planter in Hierapolis and in in Laodicea and in Colossae, one who went and, and, and was, had planted the church. But now he had taken a trip to Rome and had brought to Paul a report of the church, of what the Lord was doing, and also of the concerns, which likely spurred on Paul to write this letter to the Colossians, warning them of this, of, against false teachers, telling them of the sufficiency of Christ for salvation, and, and encouraging them in the gospel. Well, Epaphras was a church planter, but now he was far away. He was in Rome. He was not able to minister to them house to house and, and publicly uh, as he had been able to do before he went to Rome. But that didn't stop him from loving the people. It didn't stop him from ministering to the people in the way that he could. And that is specifically through prayer. He didn't forget the people. No, he labored for them. He labored for them in prayer. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He was laboring in prayer, wrestling in prayer. Mark Johnston notes that this same term for, for laboring fervently is actually is used of Christ in Gethsemane, when he was in agony in Gethsemane. And Johnston writes that the same kind of intensity that had poured out of Christ in his anticipation of the cross was mirrored in the praying of this man, Epaphras, whose deepest longing was to see the blessings secured by Jesus' death brought to full fruition in the lives of his people. His ministry had changed, but it was no less intense perhaps an example for us in these days we're not able to minister to others invite others be hospitable to others as we once could so easily but that doesn't keep us back that, that should not keep us back from ministering to people even laboring fervently in prayer on behalf of brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ here and afar how encouraged do you think the Colossian church would have been to hear about this? Epaphras hasn't forgot us. He hasn't left and, and, and left us behind uh, in his heart. No, he still labors for us. He urgently, he prays for us. He loves us. Look at his love for us. What an encouragement that would have been and to know that as the Lord was blessing them so, the Lord was answering the prayers of his servant Epaphras. What did he pray for for them? He prayed that they would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He prayed that God, who had begun a good work in them, would complete it. He prayed that they would stand firm in the truth that they had heard, that they would persevere to the end, standing firm for the Lord Jesus Christ. He prayed that they would know the will of God, how they were to live, and to live out that will. He's talking specifically, I think, of the revealed will of God 
that they would be that they would they would understand the gospel and live it out in truth and also that whatever the the hidden will of god as it was coming about in their life that they would also respond to it well william hendrickson writes that epaphras prayed that they would have a thorough rich gratifying insight into all spiritual matters an understanding which not only penetrates the mind, but also fills the heart with satisfying conviction that we know this is the right way to walk and we will walk in it. Paphras does not want these churches that are dear to his heart to be deluded or deceived by error. Paphras is doing what Paul was doing, following Paul's example. Where Paul says at the end of chapter 1 about, about his, Christian, his ministry for Christ, him we preach... This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. What does Paul want to do? He wants to present every man perfect, complete in Christ Jesus, the same term we find here. What is, what is, Paul, what is Paul doing to accomplish that? To this end, I labor, striving according to Christ's working, which works in me mightily. And what is Epaphras doing? He's doing what Paul's doing. He's laboring fervently to see the people of God complete. To see them walking faithfully till the end. And Paul testifies to this on Epaphras' behalf. He testifies it to the, to the Lycus churches, to the churches of the Lycus Valley, to Hierapolis and to Laodicea and to Colossae. I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you and for those in those other churches. He's saying Epaphras is a faithful shepherd. I'm sure Epaphras didn't tell him to write that and probably didn't, probably didn't give him the details so that Paul could praise him. But it was good for Paul to praise this faithful shepherd to the congregations, not so that Epaphras could have a swollen head, but so that the people of God would know this man loves us. Hear how he prays for us. He cares for us. And when Epaphras comes back and he's preaching the gospel, these, these, the, he would have a greater authority among them. They know this man is preaching the gospel. He's been sent. He's been endorsed by the Apostle Paul. He's a faithful man. And he loves us. It matters to know that you're loved. It matters to hear the words of the gospel of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ from a man who loves Christ and loves you. Well, besides Epaphras, we have these two others who are briefly mentioned, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas. Luke was, Luke, interestingly enough, and you may not know this, Luke actually has authored, authored more of the New Testament than any other author. You put Luke and Acts together, they are the longest two books of the, uh, the they, they, they take up the most of the, uh, the New Testament compared to the other writings. Uh, so he's, he, he's written more of the New Testament. He was a frequent companion of Paul. As you read through the book of Acts, you'll find there are times where Paul, where, he, where Luke writes of them and they and their work that they did. And other times, suddenly, there's a shift to we. We went this way. We got on a boat. We went this direction. Luke was frequently with Paul. He was his companion. In fact, he was his companion until the end, where he writes to Timothy in his last letter near the end of his life. He writes that Luke alone is with me in Rome. He was a doctor. This is where we find out that he was a doctor, a medical doctor. And finally, we have Demas. Demas, by this point, was still faithful. It's interesting. Paul will write to Timothy with much sadness in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Now, we don't know if Demas completely apostatized and left the, left, the, left the faith, or if he was one who was tired of the battle and the struggle and the fight and just left Paul, left that prison situation, left the struggles, and just went and, and in a way, withdrew in an in a unbelieving, unfaithful way. We don't know the details, and it's a sad end or a sad final testimony about Demas. But here, still, he was still walking faithful with Christ. And as far as the Colossian church knew, this, they should still have been encouraged. They didn't know what was going to come. These were, led, these were greetings that were intended to encourage them. Both the greetings from Luke and the greetings from Demas were intended to encourage the church. Even though they had not met the Colossian people, though they had not, uh, had not been among them, yet they sent their greetings, their love in the Lord Jesus Christ to this congregation. The greetings from Paul and his fellow workers show us Christ's faithful care for his church and how we should care for Christ's church. 
We've seen in these verses the ways that Paul's conclusion to the letter should have encouraged and did encourage the Colossian church. God's work in and through his faithful servants. And it provides an encouragement for us as well and lessons for how we are to live. First, we need to be encouraged. We need to see Christ's faithful care for his church. It is Christ who provided Paul and gave Paul the apostolic ministry by which Paul was ministering to other churches. It's Christ uh, who Paul was representing in writing this letter to the Colossians. And it's Christ who, through, who Paul was seeking to serve and, and it was by sending Tychicus. And it was Christ who was serving the Colossian church through, through the sending of Tychicus for this ongoing care. Ultimately, it was a provision of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. It was Christ who saved Onesimus, who brought about this, this amazing chain of events whereby Onesimus would come to Rome and come under the influence of Paul and be saved and then be sent back to the place he had run away from, but this time as one to build up the church and to build up the house of Philemon, not to discourage and take away. And a demonstration to the Colossians that Christ is indeed enough. It's something they struggled with. We need Christ plus, the Christ plus plan. And Paul is saying, look at this Onesimus. Look what Christ has done to him. He comes back full in Christ. And all these greetings and affections from these almost strangers to the Colossians. What a blessing. What an encouragement it, it should bring to our hearts to see God's work in these strangers and bringing them to faith in Christ and then bringing them to show such love to the church and specifically to the church of Colossae. And the example of the unity that they have together in Christ is so valuable and valuable also to us. See Christ's faithful care for his church through the faithful ministry of Epaphras. He labored zealously for the church. He wanted them to, to grow and to be blessed. Christ continues to provide faithful servants for the church. Christ continues to care across the thousands of kilometers for his church. Even using those who are not local to us to minister to us, to care for us, to pray for us. He still does this. Again, you're, the presbytery is praying for you, the local churches that... That, that, are faith, that, that, are, that are thankful for a faithful ministry here, and believers who once were here and now are praying for you, and who knows who, who else, whoever else. We don't know, but we can know that Christ, as he has used believers in this way before, is using believers this way again. Others praying for us. We should be encouraged. This is repeated, not just for our local church, but across the globe, across the churches, across the globe. It should encourage us to press on in the faith, press on in service to Christ, to run the race, if you're not in Christ, if you hear these words and you're not trusting in Christ and you're not in Christ, this encouragement doesn't really apply to you yet. You can't be encouraged because you're on a path of, of unbelief and you're not, you're not walking faithfully with God. You've heard, though, of how God loves to save sinners. You've heard of the love of God displayed in Jesus Christ. He saved these, these men, each one of these men with their own histories, their own backgrounds, their own sins, their own unbelief, were saved out of darkness and brought into life. We have perhaps the most explicit example in Onesimus, the slave. But, but each one of these men, including Paul the persecutor, were saved by grace. You need this salvation if you don't know Christ Jesus. You, can, you too can be made faithful to serve Christ and to love his church and to know the love of the church toward you through faith in Jesus Christ. It means coming to Christ. It means confessing your sin, your unbelief, saying, Lord, help me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, show mercy to me for Christ's sake. Put your trust in the Lord. Seek salvation only in Christ and be used of him in his service. So we can see Christ's faithful care for his church, but finally we can be, we can be Christ's faithful care for his church. We can see it and we can be it. Brothers and sisters, you and I need to learn from what we've heard this morning and we need to copy it. We need to put it into practice. We need to live as these men live towards Christ. Not all of these men were ministers, but regardless, even the, the ministers that are listed here, those who are servants of Christ, bond servants of Christ, yet still what they did is something you can do in your own capacity. You may not go you're not going out and preaching the gospel. You can, you can bring a word. Are you a Tychicus who is bringing a good word wherever you go, seeking to encourage and comfort the believers wherever you find them? 
Are you an Onesimus, once lost but now found, and desiring to give a, a reason for the hope that's within him, and to speak and to be a living, breathing testimony of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you Mark, a coward, perhaps still struggling with cowardice, but, but hearing of the power of the gospel being transformed and changed by the Holy Spirit and made useful to the ministry because you're made faithful to Christ? Are you an Epaphras, praying zealously for the church? Maybe beginning by praying for the presbytery as we have the prayer requests that come each week, praying for the churches there, praying for other churches that you know of, praying for brothers and sisters who you don't know of in different countries. Are you zealous like Epaphras, praying? Maybe praying for the churches you once were a part of? Or maybe you're one of these others, just uh, sending greetings, sending love, showing love wherever you can, however you can, to the body of Christ, wherever they are, locally and abroad. You may know little of them, but you can pray for the church. No doubt you're able to be more than just one of these things. And more besides, there are other gifts and graces. But are you using your gifts and graces to build the church? Are you seeking opportunities and using the opportunities and seeking to bless, taking learning from these examples we have? No action is too small. No prayer is too short. Brothers, uh, brothers and sisters, we can be used of God to build his church. Boys and girls, Jesus says that even if you give a cup of cold water to one who is suffering for the name of Christ, and you give it in the name of Christ, that you're doing that to Jesus himself. You are serving him. You are serving the church. We can pray. We can act. We must seek opportunity and take opportunities. What are you doing for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Question to ponder and think about. What will you, what will you do for the church or for the kingdom? Brothers and sisters, be encouraged in Christ. And be an encouragement to Christ's church everywhere. Amen. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for this rich passage of scripture. We thank you that you continue to encourage your church beyond the initial encouragement that the Colossians would have received when they got this letter from Paul. You continue to encourage our hearts to hear of the testimonies of your salvation and the lives of these men, and then we hear of how they are being used in, used in the church, and how they desire to be used to encourage the church, how they want to send their greetings, how they want to send their love, how they want to be sent to minister to the church. We thank you, Lord, for, for that same way that you work today. Thank you for all those, wherever they are in the world, who pray for us. And may we be zealous and diligent to pray for others. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you, you uh, continue to, to bless us as a church and help us to bless others, to reflect Christ. Help us to think about how we can be used of you and use us and, and give us the gifts and graces that we need to be used of you. We don't all need to do everything. But certainly, Lord, you give us all the grace to do something for the sake of the kingdom. Help us to live it out, to be faithful, to be bold, to be courageous, to be zealous and working, laboring hard. See your church grow, expand, and mature. That all your people would be made perfect, complete, doing the will of God. Lord, we thank you for this word. We praise your name for your work, O Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.